Good afternoon. I'm Francesca Nestor, Assistant Professor in Politics and Government. I'm co-director of the COVID-19 course along with Dr. Kira Bailey in Psychology and Neuroscience. It is my pleasure to welcome everyone back for the seventh lecture in our series. Today, we will learn from our panelists, Randy Quay, Don Chesebe, and Karen Paremski. Dr. Randolph Quay is the director of Ohio Wesleyan's Black World Studies program. He is an expert in the sociology of health and illness, African development, and social conditions in the African American community. Dr. Quay is the author of three books and over 20 articles in peer reviewed journals, and he is a reviewer for the Journal of Health Policy, American Journal of Managed Care, Multicultural Journal of Health and Nursing, and International Journal of Healthcare Quality Assurance. Dr. Quay also developed study abroad programs to Kenya and Zimbabwe. Don Chesebe is an instructor in OWU Black World Studies. Her general field of expertise is African history with a focus on colonialism and its relationship to the history and spread of HIV on the continent. She also is engaged with encouraging students to travel abroad and has been a part of programs taking students to Barbados, Mexico, Ghana, South Africa, Zimbabwe, Zambia, and Nambia. Recently, she has taught courses on early and modern African history, black women in the Atlantic world, feminism and hip hop, religions of Africa, South African history, social justice, hashtag Black Lives Matter and the Flint water crisis, and black women's history. Dr. Karen Paremski is an associate professor of English at Ohio Wesleyan. Her teaching focuses particularly on American literature before 1900, women's literature, and contemporary native literature. Her current research looks at the ways contemporary indigenous writers portray the complex relationships between museums, objects in museums, and native people. Her recent articles have been published in the journals Transmotion and Studies in American Indian Literatures. Dr. Paremski was the winner of the 2006 Ohio Wesleyan Shanklin Award for the Encouragement of Teachers. As a reminder, you can use the chat function to ask questions throughout the presentation. The panel speak will, will speak for about 30 minutes and then we will open up for questions. You can also continue your discussions on the COVID-19 course Facebook group. And now, Inequality and the Coronavirus Pandemic with Randy Quay, Don Chesebe, and Karen Paremski. Uh, good afternoon. Uh... It's always a pleasure to join the ongoing conversation about COVID and its impact on multiple communities in the United States. Uh, as my colleagues will, will, will discuss, uh, we are really here to argue whether in fact it is the case uh, that the outbreak of COVID-19 uh, was actually something that affected all groups. Uh, and I think uh, uh, one recalls uh, the statement by the governor of New York, uh, who seemed to suggest that uh, when it comes to COVID-19, uh, it's a great equalizer, meaning that everyone is impacted the same. Uh, but as we later found out, uh, based upon a series of studies that have been documented uh, in the Atlantic, uh, Washington Post, uh, New York Times, uh, New England Journal of Medicine, uh, it became clear uh, that there are actual desperate outcomes uh, in terms of uh, COVID-19. Uh, data provided by the Center for D Disease Control and Prevention uh, based upon demographic characteristics of COVID-19 cases uh, in 19 states uh, reported that, racially speaking, uh, whites make up 51.8% of the cases, uh, Blacks make up 28.8%, uh, Hispanic Americans make up 25.4%, uh, Asian Americans make up roughly 5%, uh, and Native Americans uh, make up less than 1% of the cases. Um, if you look specifically at Hispanic Americans, uh, making up almost 60, per, uh, 60 million people, uh, you find this proportionate impact, uh, for instance, in Iowa, uh, where they make up 6% of the population. Uh, they do account for 20% of the cases. Uh, it's also true in Oregon, uh, where you also have uh, Hispanic population making up 13% of the population, uh, they do account for 31% of the cases. Uh, in the same way in Florida, uh, Hispanic Americans make up 25% of the population, but they do account for 39% of the population, of the, of the COVID cases. Uh, and then another look at another important statistics. If you look at the number of patients who are being hospitalized, uh, because of COVID-19, it was also clear uh, based upon the CDC uh, mortality and uh, morbidity report uh, that it showed that 54.4% of those who were hospitalized were men 
uh, that in terms of age range, between 50 to 64 years of the population that were hospitalized uh, amounted to almost 44% of the numbers that were hospitalized. Uh, in terms of race, which is very similar to what I just read, uh, the percentage is 45% white, 31% black, 8.1% Hispanic, and 6.5 Asian, uh, with less than 1% for Native Americans. This is about the number of those uh, who are actually have been hospitalized uh, for COVID-19. Uh, one important statistic is also about the underlying medical conditions or symptoms. And it was clear uh, that almost 89.3% had one or more underlying conditions. And the most common reported were uh, individuals with hypertension, which is 49.7%, obesity was 48.3%, individuals with chronic lung diseases amounted to 34.6%. Uh, people with diabetes, 28.3% uh, and 27.8% with people who have um, cardiovascular diseases. Uh, so, so these are just the demographics uh, in terms of who is likely to be impacted uh, and who is also likely to be hospitalized. Uh, uh, the, the other point that I want to raise pertains to how one can interpret uh, the numbers that I just uh, read. Um, and essentially, we have to be cautious when it comes to interpreting those data, uh, because uh, for most people, I think the critical point is one's linkage to the economic system. Uh, uh, people who are more likely to be working are working in low pay jobs and therefore more likely to be vulnerable. Uh, we also know that almost 20% of uh, Hispanic and uh, Black and Latino family, and Latino, Hispanic and Asian families are more likely to live in multi-generational household. And by that I mean, uh, they are more likely to live with a parent, grandparent, grandchildren, and that in a sense makes it very difficult when it comes to uh, implementing this policy of social distancing. Uh, so that might be another contributing factor to, to the high percentage. Uh, there are also those who don't own a car and therefore they have to take public transportation. Uh, and because of that, uh, they are also more likely to be exposed that way. Uh, uh, there are some conversations, some discussions about communities of color, and more often than not, people try to blame them uh, for whatever is going on. And I think uh, it is far fetched, uh, it, it's misconceived, uh, and part of what I think we're going to do this afternoon is try to provide some basis as a way of trying to explain it. Uh, uh, and then and the last area that I would like to make uh, is really more about intervention. Uh, how do we address some of these uh, problems? And I think uh, it calls attention to the current healthcare system that we have uh, because 57% of us uh, derive health coverage through the workplace. Uh, and given the fact that we have almost 38 million Americans who are currently out of work, uh, it means their access to health insurance is a problem. Uh, the, the only safety net that most of them have uh, is the Medicaid program. Medicaid program covers roughly 70% of the population who are poor and disabled. Uh, and yet we do see states have different eligibility requirements. Uh, currently, some states are requiring Medicaid recipients to work. And given the scenario that we are in, there's no way they can work. Uh, in, in order for them to be eligible for, for this particular program. Uh, so there are a lot of issues uh, that need to be addressed and I will wait to hear more from my colleagues. Thank you. Um, so I um, was watching Twitter um, and when the CDC changed its recommendations on masks and the suggestion was made to like fabricate home masks, uh, a friend of mine actually from Columbus, Ohio named Aaron Thomas made a tweet and it said, I'm a black man living in this world. I want to stay alive, but I want to stay alive. And the tweet went viral. Um, eventually the Boston Globe ended up doing a story on him, New York Times, um, and he was interviewed in a few different places. But I think his tweet is really so important in this moment because he's talking about the fact that black people are being disproportionately impacted by what's happening with COVID physically health wise, right? But there's also this other component on it, right? His, his moment was saying that like, you want me to walk into a grocery store with a mask on my face that's been constructed out of a bandana 
and I'm a black man. Um, and I live in a state where John Crawford was killed in Walmart or where Tamir Rice was killed in a public park, you know? And so for him, this fear is, is really more than just simply like what's happening with the virus. It extends to kind of these other areas. And so uh, part of what I'm talking about is like, you know, how do you navigate those things and why do these things exist, right? Um, so part of it is going to piggyback off of what Dr. Quay was just talking about, which is the statistics of just being infected and dying from COVID at disproportionate rates. Um, there was a study that was published by AMFAR in early May um, that said that Black counties account for 22% of U.S. counties, but 50% or 52% of deaths related to the COVID virus, um, and that 91% of those counties um, exist in the U.S. South. Uh, we have other stats from places like Michigan, where at one point Black people make up 14.1% of the population, but 40% of deaths related to COVID. Um, in Illinois, Black people rep uh, are representing double the number of their population um, when it comes to COVID deaths. In places like Charlotte, North Carolina, uh, Black people make up 32.9% of the population, yet 43.9% of the deaths. And in places like St. Louis and Richmond, Virginia, there was a moment where they represented 100% of the deaths. Um, and those numbers change all the time and they're lagging. Um, a lot of places don't provide racial statistics on these numbers, so they are hard to kind of stay on top of. Uh, but these were all very specific moments in history, um, which were April and May, right? So numbers from April and May. Um, and these numbers don't even take into account Black people who are in the prison system, um, where there's obviously an overrepresentation of Black and Brown peoples, um, nor do they take into account those who are Latinx um, or Indigenous populations, uh, which one of my colleagues will be talking about in a few minutes. But again, why are Black and Brown people like contracting the virus and dying at disproportionate rates? Um, part of this has to do with what Dr. Quay was talking about, so I'm not going to Kind of go into it too much but the idea of like who has access to treatment who has access to testing um, who has their symptoms believed right so there's many times where black and brown people go into the doctor uh, with very symptoms and are told they're exaggerating um, that that these aren't actually symptoms that they're having and they're turned away so we've seen folks who who die from covid who went to the doctor four and five times trying to access tests but couldn't, right? Like nobody would uh, would provide testing for them. Um, being taken to what we call safety net hospitals um, versus the closest hospital or the most appropriate hospital. So when EMT or paramedics are transporting you, which hospital they choose to take you to, um, which, which is many times a choice, right? So which hospital they decide to go to. And then the part that Dr. Quay was talking about with these comorbidities, which reduce the body's immune system. Um, so the fact that black and brown people have higher rates of hypertension diabetes, heart disease, obesity, asthma, um, and most recently, vitamin D deficiencies were found to also be um, something that increases your risk with uh, COVID-19. And that's also overrepresented in um, Black communities. Part of these things come from living in spaces like food deserts, right, where you don't have access to uh, fresh fruits and vegetables. Part of it has to do with employment issues. Part of it has to do with living in homes with multi-generational households, like Dr. Quay was talking about, um, not having access to private health care, um, living in spaces that have poor air quality. But we also know that some of those that are also defined by class don't necessarily protect you from the racial component. Um, so there are communities like what um, is happening in Northern Virginia in Prince Edward County, which is one of the wealthiest counties uh, with a high black population that are still dying at disproportionate rates. So class is not a protectorate um, in that moment, which is, which is also a, a serious issue, right? Um, and you know, then moving beyond that, like what is happening in the prison system is something that I think needs to be talked about, especially with what's happening in Marion here, right? Um, so what is happening in the prison system? Why, um, you know, are folks still sitting in prison when many of them could be released, right? Many of them are at the end of their sentences. Um, and then I think the, the last thing that I really want to mention before um, we go into like a full discussion is that Black and brown people also have to worry about being targeted 
by social distancing laws. So there's still like yet another component. Um, and so when these social distancing laws were put in place, they were put in place to protect folks, right? Um, so have us all maintain, you know, a safe distance from each other. But who is it that's being targeted by these laws? For Ohio, in Toledo, there was a 19-year-old black male who was arrested um, for taking a bus from Detroit to Toledo because he didn't have a valid reason. Um, there were six young black men in Toledo who were arrested for being in a front yard and not being six feet apart. In Hamilton County, which is 27% black, black people make up 61% of the arrests for social distancing um, violations. In Toledo, which is also 27% black, Black people make up 78% of those who are arrested, so 18 out of 23 people. Franklin County is 23.5% Black and make up 57% of the people arrested under social distancing laws. And in Springfield, Ohio, 100% of those arrested were Black. Um, and we can see that outside of Ohio in places like New York City. Um, in Brooklyn, 35 out of 40 people who were arrested um, were Black, four were Hispanic, and one was white. Um, citywide for New York, the last statistic I found was that 68% of the arrests are Black, 24% um, Hispanic, and only 7% were white. Um, and there were moments in Manhattan uh, where people were being given masks on the street versus being arrested, whereas in Brooklyn they were being arrested. Um, and so what does that then look like, right? Uh, Representative Hakeem Jeffries equated what was happening in New York to being too similar to the way that, that things like stop and frisk functioned for a while. Um, and you know, we have news reporters who have said, this isn't the disaster we anticipated, um, or the disease turned out to be not quite as dangerous as we thought, um, but dangerous to who, right? Disastrous to who? Um, and if we're looking at black and brown populations, it's, it's been devastating. Um, and it's gonna continue to be devastating because black and brown people make up the, the, the bulk of essential workers, right? They're the people who don't have the privilege from being able to work at home or to take the transit systems in New York or do all of these things. And so the numbers that are gonna continue to rise um, while we continue to kind of open things up because it hasn't been so disastrous. Um, and so, uh, that is where I will end for now, and hopefully we can get into more with the discussion. And yeah. Thank you, Dawn and Randy. Um, I hope you guys will uh, bear with me. I had to write out my remarks. I am myself dealing with Lyme disease, and so I tend to forget things, so I had to write things down. Um, I wanted to uh, so many things are that are popping into my mind as you guys were talking. Um, I think we can come back, back to those in the discussion period. But um, I wanted to, before I start, um, give a shout out to my mom, who I think is watching today, um, and to thank my teachers. My mom was my first teacher and made me fall in love with learning. So I am so grateful. Um, and I want to acknowledge that our town, Delaware, is named after the people who call themselves the Lenny Lenape. And their language gives us our names for our rivers, the Olentangy River and the Scioto River. Um, when I started watching the news about COVID at the beginning of March, um, I, actually, let me just share my screen here. I noticed that Native people were talking about the pandemic in different ways than most others. Um, for example, Louise Erdrich on her blog said, when people say this has never happened to our country before, I want to say, yes, it has. Indigenous people suffered wave after wave of European-born epidemic diseases, which killed nine of every 10 people. The trauma continued through the flu of 1918 and the scourge of tuberculosis. When treaties were made, it was thought that Native people were going to vanish, but no, we are still here. Tommy Pico, who is a poet, he was being interviewed about this recent surge in publishing of Native poets. And he said, the apocalypse was in 1492 for us. So who better to look to than to those who have survived their own end of days? There's a resilience there that I think and hope people want to listen to. Um, so Native people have a different perspective than most of what we've been seeing in, in mainstream discussion. Um, like other people of color, Native people have particularly bad health outcomes. Um, you may have seen in the news that the Navajo Nation um, had a particularly high infection rate. In fact, in April, late April, it was third only to uh, New York and New Jersey. 
and 10 times higher than the surrounding area in Arizona uh, where the reservation is. On May the 11th, Doctors Without Borders took the unprecedented step of sending a team of medical professionals to the United States, to the Navajo Nation. Um, there was a headline about Zuni Pueblo that kind of made my heart stop for a minute. The, the people there were afraid that they were all going to, that, that they were all going to die uh, from COVID. Um, and the federal government at that point, this was early April, not, no federal funds had come forth. And so the governor of New Mexico at least uh, made testing available to all people on all Pueblo um, communities, uh, Pueblo reservations. Um, you may have seen in the news, uh, South Dakota, the governor and two particular Lakota tribes uh, got into a disagreement. The governor of South Dakota has not put into place any stay at home orders or restrictions or anything like that. They're, they've got a few now, but uh, it's taken a long time. And because South Dakota was becoming a hotspot, uh, several of the tribes uh, instituted checkpoints on roads that go through the reservations. Um, the governor threatened them and said, you don't have the right to do that. And um, the Native Nation said, actually, we do <laughs> because of the uh, Fort Laramie Treaty and also um, recent case law in the 1990s. They do have control of the highways that go through the reservation. So there's going to be a, a court case about that now. So we're seeing little snippets of um, things in the news, but um, one of the things I wanted to talk about was why is it that Native people seem to be more susceptible to this disease and to disease in general? Um, we might have been taught in school that uh, you know Native people died from smallpox because they had no immunity. Yes, that's true of the early contact period, but then after contact, we've got to look to other reasons. Um, there was an article in The Atlantic by Jeffrey Osler, a historian, um, and he argues, quote, post-contact diseases were crippling not so much because indigenous people lacked immunity, but because the conditions created by European and US colonialism made native communities vulnerable. So his reading, his article, which I put on the readings for this week, um, his, he shows how in the cases of removal, the physical conditions of, that the people were going through and disease put together is what contributed to a really high rate of sickness and death on things like the Cherokee Trail of Tears and the removal of the Sauk and Meskwaki people from, from Illinois, a little closer to home here. Um, and then Osler's article had me thinking about other ways in which um, federal policies have led to health outcomes that are not good for Native people. So um, I'll talk about two in particular. One is health healthcare. So one of the treaty obligations that the United States has to Native people in exchange for them being on reservations um, was health care, that the United States would provide health care till the grass, as long as the grass grows and the river flow, rivers flow. So Indian Health Service is the federal agency that oversees health care for Native people on reservations. And it is a, an agency that is perpetually underfunded, perpetually understaffed. A couple of years ago, when there was a freeze in government hiring, it really affected the hospitals on reservations in a bad way because they couldn't, if somebody left or, or if somebody retired, they couldn't replace them. And so they had a nursing shortage um, just in one place that I know about personally. Um, so the Indian Health Service is barely adequate to take care of its people in regular times. They are really not equipped to deal with pandemic. Um, another issue that I wanna talk about is food. Um, the picture I have here on the slide is Indian taco, everyone's favorite when we go to the powwows. Um, but this is not particularly healthy food, and it mirrors uh, the food that Native people have invented because they are getting commodities from the government. So another treaty obligation that the United States has is to provide food to Native people, because if you think you know, when people had to be confined to reservations, they didn't have the ability anymore to go get the food that they 
um, knew how to work with, or they had been moved away from the place that they had always lived. The people in Georgia were moved away from their farms. Um, uh, and in some cases, ecosystems, entire ecosystems were changed by settlers coming in and either taking out forests or putting in trees. So, uh, or putting in a railroad, the railroads were a huge disruption to the plains people in acquiring food. So the US agreed to provide food for people, but this food tended to be shelf stable, highly processed things like white flour, which you use to make fry bread, um, canned goods. Um, this kind of food leads to higher incidence of diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease, and these are exactly the kinds of things that make people more susceptible to COVID. Um, Native people have a very good, a really excellent food sovereignty movement that's gaining ground, but it's not widespread enough yet. Um, and um, serious changes need, need to happen still. Um, the other thing that I wanted to touch on is that the fact that COVID-19 is more dangerous for people over 60. So that means your elders. Um, the elders of the tribes are the ones who hold the knowledge of language. They hold the knowledge of cultural practices. Um, they hold the stories. They hold the memories. They hold the histories. So the idea that elders could be particularly um, in danger from this disease is pretty horrific. And like what Dr. Quay and Dr. Chisebe have already mentioned, housing situations are not um, are not a place where you can self isolate they have multiple families living in in one house a lot of times um, so i'm a literature scholar and i turn to literature um, i know that native people have been making art about contagion and grief and survival for hundreds of years um, in literary art we figure out questions of how people live, how they, how we think about our place in community and in time, about the decisions we make and the values we hold. I'm going to talk to you really quickly about three novels in particular. One is called Water Lily by Ella Doloria. Uh, she's a Dakota woman. Uh, she was writing this novel in the 1940s. And it's all about kinship ties. Um, the ties to each other in a tioshpaye or an extended family that lives in a village. Um, in everyday practice, in Dakota language and Lakota language, you don't call your brother Steve, you call him Misung, little brother. Um, you would refer to your kinship terms. Um, so people live in this web of relationship in families. In the novel, it shows that the illness that happens creates disruptions in the connections between people in an immediate family and people in the larger village and Water Lily's immediate family is sent away from the village to try and um, sort of mitigate the illness, but her young husband, Sacred Horse, ends up dying, and um, the text tells us, quote, it was a problem to lay the body away with anything like the tenderness and decency the matter required. Ordinarily, men handled a man's body and women a woman's body, but here, under grim necessity, the mother and wife and sister of Sacred Horse had to help. So you have a dis disruption not only in their everyday lives, but also in the ceremonial things that they have to observe. Um, and I, I feel like this novel in its emphasis on kinship helps to bring to light something that Dr. Arnold talked about weeks ago, which was that people who die and get sick are not just numbers. They're, they, that person means something to somebody. It mean, they mean something to a family and to a community. Um, the next novel I want to talk about really quickly is Tracks by Louise Erdrich. It's set in the early 20th century among Anishinaabe people. And it helps to show um, the ways that illness and policy go together to decimate Native uh, people and Native land. Um, in this novel, it begins with illness having ravaged uh, the people again, yet again. and um, what happens is since the people have no resources other than their land, they end up having to sell some of their land or sell the timber on their land in order to survive. There, since there, 
few people left and they have a hard time taking care of each other and their land. Um, and so that it's that combination of policy and illness. The last one I wanna talk about is The Birch Bark House by Louise Erdrich. Um, and it's a children's book, but it's, I actually recommend it for all kinds of readers um, because it's really helpful in learning more about native people of the Great Lakes region. It centers on the character of Omakias, who you can see there on the cover. And um, when her family becomes ill, she and her grandmother take care of everyone and their care makes a, a huge difference. Um, but her little brother dies, her baby brother dies. And then the text tells us, quote, a wholly different fever followed upon her family's recovery, an illness of weakness and grief. Omakias retreated from the world. She ate less and less, thought long into the night. There was no explanation that satisfied her, nothing that gave her the hope she needed to rise and take up the rest of her life. So she becomes depressed and it helps to show us like, you know, just a, a simple one person dying makes a huge difference emotionally to the life of the family. And the way that they have to climb out of this soul sickness is to help each other and to remind each other about who they are. And, um, and even the baby brothers, um, the sense of that relationship with the baby brother eventually brings her some kind of comfort. Um, so for, for me, the literary texts help us to see like how people get through catastrophic illness and how those um, relationships are, you know, we have to remember those relationships when we're, think, when we're hearing the numbers, we have to remember that those are people and those are families that are affected. Um, and then the last question, uh, two more questions that I want to end with. And um, one of the things that I've learned a lot from Native literature is to think about who I am as a relative to other people. Am I, am I a good relative? What are the actions of a good relative? So that's something I've been thinking about with this illness. Can we be good relatives to each other? Can we be good relatives, not, in our, not just in our immediate family, but also in our community and even in our nation? And furthermore, how can the United States be a good relative to native nations? How can our policies and practices be those of a good relative? Thank you. Thank you all. And I want to encourage our participants to send in questions to the chat, but I will just start with a question. Um, if there were folks listening today who are really surprised and, and disturbed by what they've learned through your panels, through your panel, I'm, I'm curious, what would you all recommend as the best sources of information for people to learn more and be more aware of this side of COVID-19? Uh, I I would recommend, as I did previously, uh, the New England Journal of Medicine uh, always uh, publishes uh, good articles, particularly with COVID now. Uh, for the last month or so, they have been focusing on COVID, uh, its impact on different communities. Uh, they've been looking at uh, international comparisons in terms of the approaches that other countries have taken. Uh, and then luckily, there are actually a lot of series of uh, discussions in the New York Times, in the Washington Post, uh, in the Guardian, in the Atlantic, uh, that also touches on different aspects of, of COVID and its impact on different communities. So, so those, I think, might be ways to, to at least begin to, to get more information about that. And, and, of, and don't forget the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. Uh, they do have a weekly report uh, that documents some of these trends as well. Um, I will just echo Professor Quay and say that um, The Atlantic and The Guardian have been um, keeping track of what's happening and, and running some good informative stories. NPR in particular has been doing, has been paying attention to what's going on in the Navajo Nation. And so they have a series of articles that have been really informative and good. But um, there's also native sources of journalism. One of the best is Indian Country Today, and they have a website, indiancountrytoday.com, and they are running stories um, about 
um, how COVID is affecting uh, various reservation populations. I think I would. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, I think I would echo most of what you both have said. I've been reading The Atlantic quite frequently. Um, they tend to have, you know, really good links within the articles to show you where they're getting their statistics from. Um, I also follow social media uh, just because I feel like that's how people get their stories out. So um, I also, you know, suggest paying attention to social media if you can. So things like Twitter and uh, Facebook, sometimes TikTok, um, they all have people who are talking about this. So you get more of the like social understanding of what's happening. Yeah. I will just piggyback on that, um, that uh, if you're on Facebook, one really amazing group to look for is the social distance powwow. Um, there it's full of native people who it started with uh, women who were dancing the jingle dress dance, which is a healing, um, a healing practice. And it has grown and thousands and thousands of Native people there are sharing um, not only their traditional dance and song, but also um, a lot of Native healthcare workers are there um, sharing their stories about what their experience is like, um, trying to care for people who are sick. Um, and it's, it's a really good, a really good source of inspiration that doesn't, that's not the right word I want. <laughs> it, it gives me hope. It gives me hope that um, there are things that people are doing um, about about their personal well-being, um, even as we ask for more to be done on a systematic systematic institutional level. Thank you. And we have some participants who are also chiming in with ideas for places people can look for more information. Um, Karen, you mentioned, you know, the actions of a good relative, which I, I really, really liked. And I wanted to ask all of you, clearly, these problems are uh, rooted in long term systemic problems. But I'm wondering if you could speak to if we want to have the country act as a good relative moving forward. What do you see as some of the short-term solutions and what do you see as more, some of the more long-term solutions that we need to embark upon? I'll, I'll jump in for um, one short-term solution that comes to mind immediately is that the United States has to honor its treaties with native people. Uh, we have to fulfill our treaty obligations to Native people. There's just no ifs, ands, or buts about that. Um, and now that there are Native people, more Native people in Congress than there have been <laughs> ever, I think, um, we have a chance of um, the federal government at least um, taking those issues more seriously. Um, let me think about the uh, long-term stuff. I think the short run uh, to follow up on Karen's point, uh, I do think that there should be emphasis on mass testing. Uh, we're still not testing enough. Uh, the, the, the numbers indicate that we have only tested less than 5%, and that is not enough uh, if we're going to actually address the problem. So uh, I would suggest more money going into, into testing, and particularly in those communities that uh, hardest hit uh, the areas where I think our uh, priority should be in the first uh, in the first instance. Uh, the second short term uh, remedy that I would suggest is really we need to have some extended food service uh, that will allow households to be able to get food. Uh, so maybe making sure that all the food banks in the local areas are equipped uh, to be able to provide uh, short term food assistance to our neighbors might be a, a good way forward. Uh, in terms of long term, uh, I think uh, we have to learn from other countries. We have to uh, address it as a major issue in terms of income inequality. We have to look at it from the standpoint of how can we ensure that people have adequate access to healthcare, uh, irrespective of who they are, uh, what kind of work they do, uh, where they're coming from. And I think that will be part of the broader long-term solution that we need to strive 
All right, we have some folks asking, um, what should we do as people who are taking this course? Where can we focus our attention to help some, um, if not long-term, at least short-term ideas move forward? I like the fact that uh, uh, high school students and college students are taking time off uh, and visiting uh, elderly homes uh, and also uh, going to the homes of people who are elderly and trying to provide some kind of assistance. Sometimes they'll go to them, uh, take their grocery list and go to the store and buy them some items uh, and deliver it uh, at, their, at, their, at their doorsteps. And then I think it's at least in the short run, one immediate thing that uh, we can all do is to really find out uh, who are vulnerable in our communities, what kind of assistance they need uh, and how we might be able to support them, either financially or even just going to the grocery to get what they need and bringing it to them, uh, making sure that they're keeping up on their medications. Uh, if they run out of it, maybe we can go to the, the local drugstore to, to make sure that they get their medication filled. Uh, and those are some of the you know, practical things that we can all do uh, in the short term. Yeah. And I would say that in addition to that, I've seen in Columbus, at least, where a lot of folks are participating in um, dropping food off in the boxes, the free boxes that are just lined on streets, um, and then making sure that people know that those boxes are available and what's in them. Um, and folks have also been advocating for trying to get some fresh things in there um, because they're, they are able to be accessed so quickly right now. Um, so I think that that's another really simple way to kind of get there is if you do leave that grocery store, dropping some of the stuff off in one of those boxes and then letting folks know that it's there. I've seen some younger children who are creating new boxes, like uh, in Columbus, they call them blessing boxes. Um, but the I've seen younger uh, students who are creating them on their own and just making temporary ones in their yards and then just putting it on social media so people know that it's there and then bringing it home at night and putting it back out in the morning. Um, so I think that that's a really easy way to try to get folks to, to have access to food. Um, but then also just listening, right? So listening to what people are going through and not immediately discounting it, right? So understanding that there are these kinds of disparities. Um, and then once you learn about them, maybe teaching somebody else about them uh, so that we can kind of spread the knowledge of what's happening uh, to communities of color uh, during this time period. And, and, and maybe that will also make a difference in some way. Yeah, I would say, um, and to sort of echo something that Professor Chisebe said before, and it, that is to pay attention. Um, if you do, if you are on social media, like find people to follow, um, who can tell you what's going on. You can get informed about what's going on. Um, I, in the long term, too, I think, you know, I've, I've seen a lot of people talk about this epidemic as a chance. You know, Dr. Arnold said in the beginning, very first session of the class, and I'll, <laughs> this is a great, I, um, a great thing to note, that disaster unveils uh, the way things actually work instead of the way you think they work and they, it unveils the power structures that are at play. So since it is doing just that, since this pandemic is doing just that, it's time for us to, time for, uh, time for people to notice what's happening and don't look away, like pay attention, do something about it, say something about it. Um, it's a moment where we could have some reckoning uh, about what is, going on in this country and what the power structures are and what and how things actually are instead of how we would like them to be. Um, and, and so pay attention to that and um, be in touch with your representatives, even if you think they won't, even if you think they're not sympathetic, be in touch with your representatives, be informed about who's on the ballot in November um, and what kinds of interests they Present, uh, they represent. Um, I think that's one thing we can do. Last week, we enjoyed the international comparative perspective with Dr. Kay and Dr. Franklin. Um, we have uh, a participant asking, uh, in other countries, um, do we find these disparities in testing, treatment, and outcomes happening? Well, I, I do think uh, it's not as 
pervasive as we have it in this country. And part of it will be uh, due to the fact that they do have a lot of safety nets. Uh, I mean, for instance, I've done some work in, uh, in Nordic countries, and I do know that uh, everyone has access to healthcare irrespective of their income. Uh, they do have maternity leave, they have paternity leave, they have sick leave. So, so, so the issue here in terms of how people can access healthcare uh, under this current condition is not an issue for them at least, uh, given the fact that they have a well-developed welfare state in that regard. Uh, the other thing that I've also noticed some of these countries did, particularly in England, uh, is rather than giving people stimulus check, uh, what they did was the government just gave the money to the employers uh, and told the employers, just keep your employees. Uh, we'll pay them. And that, I think, went a long way uh, to allow some of these countries to be able to tamp down the economic impact of COVID uh, in their respective uh, countries and communities. And that is something that maybe we should have done, uh, but, but I guess uh, it's something moving forward, maybe uh, our congressmen and women should, should think about, about doing that rather than just doing our stimulus checks, uh, which, which is what we need in the short run, but it doesn't address the long-term needs of every citizen in this country. I mean, I've seen some talk about uh, communities being impacted differently in places like Canada uh, with the indigenous population there. Um, so I have seen some of that. Um, I have not looked at the numbers for the racial disparities. I would assume that there is some difference happening in a, in a place like that. Maybe if we looked at the numbers in Toronto um, or in the indigenous communities there, but I haven't looked at the numbers. I've only seen kind of the rumblings online um, because racial disparities exist globally. Um, like these things exist globally. So the healthcare systems um, you know, having more social forms of healthcare absolutely help, right? Um, but if you're looking at some of the factors on the ground um, or just living day-to-day -day life, there's still going to be those racial disparities existing globally. Um, it's just how they present in a moment like COVID. Yeah. Relatedly, um, there's a participant citing a map provided by Johns Hopkins that showed that um, some African countries have fewer cases of COVID-19 um, and she's wondering what, what explains those lower rates within these African countries? Uh, okay, so, so there are two issues. One uh, is most of these countries, I can use Ghana as an example. I, I came up from Ghana. Uh, the, the president was very proactive. Uh, initially, when they, uh, they, they had when that the cases were going to spread to other parts of Africa. So they actually put in place social distancing uh, two weeks before I tried, they had a new case in Ghana. Uh, so that was one thing that they did. Uh, the second was really they used a lot of local media uh, to try to educate the population about this need to maintain safe distance. Uh, and it was done in local languages. Uh, uh, they used music, they used other kinds of arts platforms to try to educate the general population about, about this. Uh, uh, so that seemed to work. And then some are saying maybe they are not counting adequately uh, uh, because they are not doing a lot of the testing. So perhaps the numbers are higher than what is being presented. Uh, and I, I tend to agree that perhaps uh, the numbers are a little bit higher than what is being presented. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, they seem to have been proactive in terms of addressing uh, and making sure that the general population is aware of what they need to do uh, to be able to contain uh, COVID. Uh, in Tanzania, for instance, uh, the government is pursuing a policy very similar to what uh, the Swedish government is doing, that they are not engaging in any or enforcing any quarantine. They are just letting people go about their normal businesses. And, and what I've been hearing uh, is that in Tanzania, compared to other African countries, the numbers are very high. Uh, you know, so it's really an experiment, I guess, uh, that some countries are enforcing social distancing others are not. Uh, uh, and it will be very interesting at least to know in the long run uh, which of these policies or programs uh, actually worked uh, in, in the long term. Yeah, I could echo that for some of Southern Africa as well. I have family in Zambia and they were locked down very quickly. So um, there's uh, Victoria Falls borders the is the border between Zimbabwe and Zambia. And it was closed very quickly because of it, it being such a large tourist space. Um, and they're still on lockdown. So uh, they're still 
businesses are closed, tourist spaces are closed. Um, a lot of places cut down the flights coming in and out really early on. Um, and I think that was really useful, but I do also think there's a lack of access to testing as well. Um, so, you know, there are people um, who just simply can't get tested uh, depending on what, what part of the country they're in. But I, I think it's very similar to what Dr. Quay was talking about. This question is um, for you, uh, Dr. Paremsky. Um, in Dr. Arnold's presentation, she spoke a good bit about um, specific pandemics and, and their place in history. Um, and the participant is wondering um, what specific lessons or happenings um, might you be able to speak to um, in terms of past pandemics in tribal nations? Um, so it's difficult there have just there have been so many that are it's difficult to to pinpoint like this is what people learned um and again i look to literary texts um to tell me you know because they're based not just on history but on imagination um i think one of the things uh, that i read in the literature some of the some of which i talked about um, is the lesson about adaptation, um, about how you have to go on uh, even with people missing from your family or from your village or from your community. Um, you have to grieve, and I, I mean you're going to grieve, um, but you have to figure out ways to deal with grief um, in order to go on, um, and you, I mean, and, and that's depicted in the novels that I mentioned, um, and, uh, there's a, there's a really good term in, uh, that a theorist coined that's survivance. It's S-U-R-V-I-V-A-N-C-E. And it's a combination of survival. So you do what you got to do <laughs> to get by, but also resistance that you um, insist on your ways. You, 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 you insist on your culture, your language, your, your worldview, your um, ceremonial practices. You resist any sort of oppression that would take those things away. So that's that com combination of just do what you have to to get by and make sure that you're resisting things being erased. I think that that combination I see over and over again in all sorts of native art. I hope that answers the question. It does. Thank you. Uh, how does the urban rural um, divide um, lend itself to these sorts of disparities that you all have been speaking of? I think one major difference is really uh, population density. Uh, and I think uh, given the way in which uh, COVID-19 spreads, uh, one would expect to see uh, high percentages in areas where you have more people congregated. Uh, and given the fact that our cities are almost the areas where we tend to see more people congregate. Uh, that may be one reason uh, to account for that. Uh, and then the other factor, obviously, would be who live in the city, who is more likely to live in the city. Uh, and that also seemed to attract uh, more people of color, uh, particularly in that segment of the city. And therefore, given what we have been describing uh, in terms of who is more vulnerable, who is more likely to be affected, uh, who is more likely to be in the low-skilled uh, labor market, uh, and who is more likely to experience persistent discrimination and, uh, and stereotypes. Uh, all those factors do contribute to uh, this rural urban divide. Uh, I'm not saying that it doesn't exist in rural communities, uh, but at least in rural communities, it is not as densely populated as in urban centers. Uh, and more often than not, uh, it doesn't, I guess, attract the same kind of demographics as it would uh, in, in urban centers. I think um, one, um, what Dr. Kwe is saying is exactly right. And then one complicating factor on reservations, which tend to be rural, is that you have the multi-generational um, housing. You have people, multiple generations living in one space. In most reservations, housing is a, a problem. There's a shortage on, in most places. And so you have um, lots of 
people living in one space, you can't self isolate. So that's, um, that's one complication with um, native spaces. Um, Dawn? <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say something similar about the US South with rural populations where you do have larger black rural populations, um, but a lot of times they have to work in urban spaces um, or they go to school in urban spaces. Um, and then looking at the way that healthcare functions in both of those places is, is so different as well. So um, there can be pros and cons to each space when it comes to the healthcare systems. Um, so do you have access to appropriate health care? Is there a hospital that has a large enough ICU to be able to handle what's happening with, with some of the respiratory issues um, that come along with COVID-19? All of those kinds of things, I think, factor into all of this. So here's a final question for you all. Um, as we move through this crisis, and, and someday it will be in our collective past, um, as we do that, what things make you most concerned as we move through and what things make you optimistic as we move through if anything uh, for me i think um, my concern really revolves what we currently have uh, even before covid 19 uh, the life expectancy among minority communities it is almost five years less uh, than white communities so uh, and that for me is more systematic uh, that, that we need to address discrimination, we need to address our schooling system, we need to create opportunities for all our citizens to be able to go to school, to be able to excel, to be able to find more stable paying jobs. Uh, we also need to ensure that everyone has our access to healthcare. And unless we do that, uh, we're still going to deal with the same kind of issues uh, as we move forward. Uh, but, but I'm uh, optimistic in the future, given the fact uh, that we have had opportunity to be able to talk about this, uh, that we know how it impacts all of us, uh, even directly or indirectly, uh, and that we hope our government will listen uh, and try to take uh, a proactive action to address some of these disparities that exist in our communities. Yeah, I mean, you know, like Dr. Kway said, all of these things existed before they're just now showing themselves in different ways. Um, and so absolutely, I mean, these systemic and structural things like have to change at some point. Um, I'm also really concerned about how us opening up continues to impact the communities that we're talking about. Um, because again, you know, there are folks who are privileged enough to be able to work from home. And then there are others who have to be at the store when we go there or who have to pack the meat that people are buying in the groceries or that have to do all of those things. Um, and so I, I think that we're gonna continue to kind of see those numbers spike. Um, and that, that scares me a little bit. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of people in this class. There's a lot of people talking about it. And that gives me hope. Right, that people are willing to, to talk about racial disparities, that people are willing to kind of hear what's happening um, and be open to those discussions, I think is part of the first step um, in being able to correct some of this. So if you know, now you can try to do something to, to make this a, a better situation for everyone else. So, yeah. Oh, there we are. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, I would, I, I absolutely agree uh, with Professor Chesebe. I, I am really concerned about the push to open back up. I'm very, very concerned about people wanting to deny that we still have a problem and going out, you know, it's uh, going out to get their nails done or go to a bar or something um, while other people are suffering that and, and putting, you know, your your exercise of your privilege putting something someone else in danger putting their families in danger that that concerns me a lot i'm very concerned about that but um the i'm i'm in the same boat I, the thing that gives me hope is that the veil has been lifted we cannot deny that these things are true um and so now now it's up to us to actually do something about it. It's up, it's up to us to insist from uh, people who are in power that we do something about it. Um, and on a, on a local, more local level, 
as Professor Chisebi says, talk to people. Um, now that we see these things, be open about it, be speaking about it, um, be sharing that information. Thank you to our three panelists for sharing your time and knowledge with us. And thank you to the audience for joining us and asking excellent questions as usual. And don't forget that you can continue your conversations on the Facebook group. Another way to continue the conversation is the Meet the Prof sessions. The student session is Thursday at four in Blackboard Collaborate and the community members can join us at noon on Friday in Blackboard Collaborate. RSVP links will be provided. If you have any questions, please contact COVID class coordinator at owu.edu, and we will see you again on Wednesday at 4 p.m. for How the Pandemic Exposed What's Great and Not So Great in Our Public Schools with Dr. Michelle Noble. Thank you all.